Hey everybody, Christine Morrell here. Today I'm going to be interviewing Ariel Hyatt. She released an incredible book called Crowd Start, which is a roadmap for artists to see and learn how to hold their own successful crowdfunding campaign. She's held her own crowdfunding campaign where she raised $60,000 and she's also helped other artists raise their own money for their own projects. Guys, this is a must watch if you want to learn how to crowdfund for your next project. Let's go. All right, hey everybody, I'm Christine Morell. Welcome to Music Hustler Live. Today we're going to be chatting with Ariel Hyatt. Thank you so much for joining me, Ariel. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And we're going to be talking about crowdfunding. I know that crowdfunding is one of those things that a lot of people are like totally scared of. There, it's very intimidating. And we're going to talk about because you have a book called Crowd Start, and you talk about what to do, what not to do to have a successful crowdfunding um, campaign. So first, I would love for you to introduce yourself and, and just tell everybody a little bit about you and how you became well known and well versed in this subject. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate what you're doing for artists everywhere. Um, my story is I am Ariel Hyatt. I run a company called Cyber PR. I have worked with independent musicians uh, for my entire adult life. Literally the minute I graduated college, I started working at a record label. From there, a concert promotions company. From there, started my own business. That was 25 years ago. We primarily do publicity and marketing for indie artists. And I've seen the whole sort of rise of this new music business that we are all hustling in today. And I had a front row seat when crowdfunding started to really get into the mainstream. And a lot of my artists started to do it. And I started to become incredibly interested in what worked versus what did not work. And because I also do a lot of coaching for our marketing and PR clients, because as you know, because you're doing this right here in this group, a lot of the whole marketing and promo and publicity and any of it is about having the right mindset. And if your mind is not straight, you're not going to do well. So I ended up by default, just because I was the other person on the, on the end of the phone for my artists, hearing a lot of the struggles and stress around crowdfunding, which I became obsessed with. And I am very much a person who likes to practice what I preach. I am not a musician, but I've been in service to musicians my whole life. And I thought, I'm going to try crowdfunding. So a couple of years ago, I launched a crowdfunding campaign. I raised $62,000. I can't believe I did it. It was the most excruciating 30 days of my life. And I wrote a book about it. So that's what CrowdStart is. And um, I'm excited to get into it with you today. Awesome. Now, had you ever held like a crowdfunding campaign before that, that had just like bombed or anything like that? So this was no. your first one you went, but you had just been working with other people. So you kind of had already gathered what was working and not working. That, and also I had the distinct privilege of having studied internet marketing, which a lot of that comes into play when you're doing crowdfunding. I think when you see artists or anyone not do well in crowdfunding, a lot of it has to do with not understanding what you're what it's what it's really about what it really and truly is is it's a marketing and sales campaign and a lot of creative minds and artists and musicians suck at sales <laughs> it's not what we're wired to do we're wired to make art we're wired to create we're wired to write we're wired to share our gifts with the world. And for many of us, selling does not feel natural or good. Um, and, and let's make no mistake, a crowdfunding campaign is a sales campaign, full stop. Yep, I think that's a huge point to make because I've seen 
I saw someone actually start a crowdfunding campaign. They posted it on their Facebook and within like three days, they posted this like, I'm so mad at everybody. Nobody's supporting my crowdfunding campaign. They were so angry. I think that one, it can be really um, intimidating. Like we talked about a little earlier, it can be really scary for people. Um, but we, you and I have talked about it, that it's not just about posting, hey, I'm doing a crowdfunding campaign. Yeah. What are like the, I mean, there's so much work you have to do before you even yes. think about crowdfunding. Yes. What are some of those things that you would say, like an artist, before you even think about having a crowdfunding campaign, what are like a few main things that you have to have in order before you can even do something like that successfully? So if you've ever heard the old adage, measure twice, cut once, you know, I think of that often with a crowdfunding campaign, it's like measure 350,000 times, cut once. So Definitely, there is a huge preamble to running a good and effective campaign. And the thing that I like the most about the fact that we now have many, many years of statistical evidence about what works versus what doesn't work, and a lot of the crowdfunding platforms actually will tell you what works versus what doesn't work, like, for example, how many days your campaign should be, what time of year to run one, you know, these are all things that we now have years of data which I think is really helpful. So before you think about it, you want to look at the data and ask yourself, you know, just because you're desperate at the end of the year, because that's when you want to put your album out, maybe launching your crowdfunding campaign around Christmas time is not a great idea. Right. I did that. Trust me, I did that. And a lot of my friends were like, yeah. we're totally broke. It's Christmas time. Um, right. And I learned a tremendous lesson that maybe that was not the best time to do that. Okay, so one thing you want to know is the science, what works, what doesn't work, sort of statistically. Um, you also have to want to choose which platform is right for you. Of course, there are many. Do you want to be a Kickstarter, sort of go for it all? Do you want to do Indiegogo? Are you a GoFundMe kind of person? Um, What's so those... the difference? That was actually one of the questions I wanted to ask you. What, what would you recommend? And it, does that depend on the goal of the artist as well? I think, it, I think it does depend on the goal. If you know, So there's kind of two ways that you can do it. You can do a, I'm doing this crowdfunding campaign, and unless I get all the money, it does not succeed and I do not complete it. So those campaigns are very motivating because if you don't get them over the finish line, it sucks. You know, if you're going for $10,000 and you only get seven, how bummed are you going to be? So um, does all the money go back to them if they, if you don't, uh, yes. that's on Kickstarter. So that could, that could be on Kickstarter uh, okay. on a website like Indiegogo they have an option where you can say, I'm trying to raise $10,000, but if I only get seven, I would like to keep that and do like a partial campaign, which I think if, if you're going to go through all the agony and pain of a crowdfunding campaign, I think $7,000 is a great number, even if you wanted 10 or five is a great if you wanted seven or whatever it is. So but if you're the go for broke, I only can do my project if I can only get X amount of dollars and it won't do for me to get less, you could certainly do 100%. Then, of course, there's a more, I don't love um, GoFundMe for artists making albums. I really think of that platform as more of a platform for personal tragedy, medical, um, I often see, you know, you read stories in the newspaper about people that have had really, really hard things happen in their lives and GoFundMe campaigns are set up to benefit them. I don't think it's a great look when you're using like a medical platform to raise money for your album. So, okay. you know, but look, it's up to you. And I think there's, there's always elegant ways of spinning things, but um, so those are, those are some of, you know, Indiegogo and, and um and Kickstarter, I think, are the two that you, you should look at and look at the nuances between the two. Okay. So you understand now you've got your prep, your platform. The next thing that you want to do as you're rolling up is you want to be as prepared as you possibly can before the first day you launch. And 
that means you will have to write a lot of emails, a lot of social posts. You'll have to figure out video content because video is what everybody is interested in looking at, of course, on Instagram, TikTok, wherever it is you're promoting. So you do not want to leave that you know, your campaign is halfway through and you don't have like enough content because you should be communicating very consistently and very regularly as you move forward. But the number one thing that you need before you start your crowdfunding campaign is an email list and an email list program to manage your email list. Do not be trying to do a crowdfunding campaign, BCCing people on your Gmail. Terrible look. Mm. So an email list with lots of friends and family and people that you've gathered together to specifically send this campaign to is a huge, huge part of how, of how you will succeed. Now, once you, you know, get together you, you, you're planning it out, right? We're planning it out. And you're talking about having enough content. I've seen people where they post like a picture of their, you know, GoFundMe campaign or whatever it is over and over and over again. It's the same thing over and over again. Support my campaign, support my campaign, support my campaign. You, listen you know, to my I, music, listen to my yeah, music. Listen exactly. to my music. Like, people, what, <laughs> what do you recommend? Like, what's the different type of content that someone could post? rather than just the same thing over and over again. What have you seen that's been most uh, successful in that? So CrowdStart is actually a roadmap that teaches you the book that I wrote exactly what to do. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that everyone that is coming along on your crowdfunding journey understands that this is a journey, that you are sticking your neck out, that you are doing something that feels a little scary. I think if you come at it with a lot of bravado, or if you come at it and you're just saying, here's my campaign, here's my campaign, here's my campaign, here's my campaign, like, of course, no one's going to listen. So you want to be smart about how you are taking your people on your list and on your social media on a journey of your campaign. It's just like how you might take them on a journey of how you're recording your album or recording your single. Take them behind the scenes. Show them a little bit about what you're gonna do with the money when you get it. Show them you know, why it feels scary for you to ask for money. Give them a sense that they're in it with you. You know, I think that is a great thing to think about when you're preparing Um, your, your stuff to put in for your campaign. So I think that's very important. Um, I recommend in CrowdStart that you do a series of emails or videos where you're revealing parts of yourself that you maybe have never revealed before. You know, when you sit down to write your biography or your band bio or your profile for your website or your social channels, there's all this stuff that you can't fit into a bio, but there's a lot of things that are very interesting about why you're an artist, how you became an artist that you could certainly include in your crowdfunding campaign. So I say the the best way to get people to really want to reach into their pockets and give you money is to peel back the layers of, of the onion. Who are you? Why are you doing this? What does music mean to you? What do your fans mean to you? What would it mean to you if you could have this money, this support? Because it's also not about just money, right? Because it's about also the bond with your fans. It's about understanding who they are. It's about, uh, it's about asking them to reach into, it's not only their pocketbook, they're reaching into their, their trust asset for you. And they're becoming people that you might not know are your super fans can really show up for you when you do a crowdfunding campaign. So unless you're willing to show a little bit of yourself or a lot of yourself during the crowdfunding journey, those fans are not going to make themselves known. I think that's such a good point because, you know, in in a lot of the other things where I cover like how to release a single, how to release a music video, how to build a fan base. That's always the topic. And I think that there's a, something goes wrong when people think of 
your music career, especially as an independent, as something that's just transactional. You know, like I make good music, so people should buy it. Right. People aren't, you know, I mean, you think about your favorite restaurant. Sometimes you don't go there because the food's just absolutely immaculate. Of course, the food has to be good, but maybe you know the owner or maybe you like the waitress or the bartender's your friend. There's always some sort of personal connection that you have when you go to a business. Um, and the same thing with our music careers. And we have to think of it, it's not just a transaction. We're not just here, here, give me $5, I need it for my music. We have to create that relationship with them. And like you said, peel back the layers, talk about why we wrote this song or why we're doing this campaign. Or maybe our grandmother that passed away always said we could do this. And maybe this is our final, you know, um, you know, first crowdfunding campaign and our final album that we're going to put out or whatever that is, but to share those personal things and to not think of it just as I make good music, they should support me. Like you said, they're trusting you. And the way that I always thought of it when I was um, performing, I would have my little tip jar. People would come and tip me and I would think those people work so hard for their money, you know, think about why should they give it to you? They need to feel good. It's not just for a song that they're going to listen to in their car. Yeah. You know, they want to feel good about something. I mean, have you found that that's been your experience? A hundred percent. And it's not only about feeling good. It's also about feeling like they're part of something. There's a really interesting group of articles that are sort of hitting the media now that we're into a year and a half of COVID lockdown, not lockdown, lockdown again. People feel very isolated now. People feel very disconnected. Historically, Globally, we are at an all time low for community. People don't go to church anymore as much as they used to. We are at an all time low for that. So there is a huge need for people wanting to feel like they are part of something. And all the isolation and this past year of being sequestered from friends and family and loved ones and schools and workplaces has only exacerbated that and made it much, much harder. Being part of a music community fosters something that I love, it's called collective effervescence. Collective effervescence is a term that came to my attention from reading a lot of articles about all this pain and suffering that we're going through. And it, it means getting a feeling from other people. You create collective effervescence when you create music, which is, I am like a collective effervescence core. That is all I want. That's why I do my life. Right. And that's why I serve musicians because in my mind, there is really no one else that fosters collective effervescence as much as musicians performing. That's what the experience of going to see live music actually is. So if you can think about that and you can think about how do you foster that kind of effervescence in your communications around your crowdfunding campaign? How do you make people feel special, like they're part of something, you will fund as mm -hmm. long as you, as long as you plan well, but I see it over and over. The more artists are willing to share and be open and, and it doesn't have to be like, you're talking about your divorce and your cancer and your, you know, horrible heartache. Like, it, I don't mean like, you know, go and share things that feel uncomfortable, but it, it does mean that you do have to include people. There's a, a woman um, who, who runs a fabulous music venue up near where I live. And um, her name is Jenny Rubin. And the music venue is also on a farm because I live in rural Massachusetts now. And she posts videos of herself dancing with the sheep, with the pigs. And she's like got prints on and she's like going crazy in her house with her dogs. And she takes us all on this journey. Like I want to go support her music venue and be around her because of this, this journey. I don't know anything about her. Is she married? I, none, none of it. I just love this energy. So it does not have to be again about pouring your soul into it. Although if that's, if that's your vibe and if you do have something like that, that's deep that you want to share, yes. But there's many, many ways of um, bringing people along for a journey without putting your guts all over the floor. That's fantastic. I love that. Well, and you know, you had said something the other day 
when we were chattering, uh, chattering, chatting, chattering, is that a word too? I think it is. It is, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> we were talking and you had said, hey, if there's no crowd, there's no crowdfunding. That's true. And you had talked about, you had talked about the other, and I thought that was, to me, that hit me and I, I even thought about it for days after because I was like, yeah, that's the whole point, crowd fund, right? You have to build this crowd. Now, going back to kind of what you were talking about with um, the list, when I first held my first crowdfunding campaign, it was, um, I actually didn't have an email list, but I had um, a very, I would spend like hours a day writing people back on MySpace. So this was back, you know, a while back. Um, and I would be there on MySpace. And I remember the very first time I posted something, I don't even know if like Kickstarter existed or what. I just, I had this idea. I was like, I bet if I asked my fans for money, they might help me because I needed to, to record this single. And everybody liked the single. And I knew that I was getting hundreds of messages a day. So I knew that I had this crowd. So even though I didn't have the email list, I still had the crowd though, like you said, on MySpace. So I remember I made like a PayPal button or something like that, where people could donate whatever amount they wanted to. I let them know, hey, you guys have heard my single. I'm just trying to record a radio version of it because I'd like to go out and promote it on the radio. And I remember the very first person that donated, donated $500. And I was Amazing. like, I was like, what is going on here? First of all, I didn't even know people had like $500 to just give away because mm -hmm. I was like, that's insane. And then the fact that they would just give it to me and they didn't even know me, but we chatted on MySpace all the time. We talked. I didn't treat them like this transaction. Right. It was human experience. Like that's the one thing is we're not dealing with computers. We're dealing right. with other humans. And I think right. that's kind of what you're saying and I, it's just it's it really hits you like when you see something like that I, I thought when I saw that that was like my mind like exploded with what I thought wow that's amazing when you create that relationship with people yes yes it is now in um when you do like the the you know kickstarter and indiegogo which you said those are the two platforms that you would recommend more than like GoFundMe. Do each of those have like tiers, you know, it, or, or how do they do that? You know, like if someone, cause I think that's a big thing that I hear from artists is they say, I don't wanna do a crowdfunding cause I feel like I'm asking people for something like too much. But then one thing that I have shared is, but you're also giving them something, right? Like if they donate a hundred dollars, you can give them like a live stream ticket, right? Or you can give them a t-shirt, you can give them something. So they're actually, purchasing something, a service or merchandise. Am I yeah, correct? Of course you are. And I think that there is something really important to, to, you know, if the word crowdfunding freaks you out so much, because it's just like a weird word, you can think of it as a pre-sale campaign. I am pre-selling things leading up to this release or whatever it is. So yes, again, back to the science, I, I looked at tens of thousands of campaign uh, data, having between seven and nine tiers or levels is about the right amount for a campaign. So if you ever like just even go on to Kickstarter and search the music projects and start looking, some people have like 30 things. That's too much. Wow. Having three or four things might not give you enough high end offerings. I, I looked at a campaign the other day that had like four and it was like $5, $15, $25, and $75. You know, that's not leaving the person with 500, like your friend on MySpace, any opportunity. So I advocate nine and even like one crazy bonus tier that's like insane. Like put your neck out so far and be like, here is a, a tier that is so expensive and here's what you're going to get. And there's only one. And you never know, maybe, I mean, in, in my campaign, I had a tier for $7,500. There was only one. I put it on there. My campaign, because I'm an idiot, ended on December 31st, New Year's Eve. <laughs> I was standing in the grocery store shopping for New Year's Eve dinner. My phone rang. There was a frantic voice on the other, other end. I'd never heard of this person in my life. And she said, I'm trying to pay for the $7,500 option and the crowdfunding campaign. I'm, I used one called rocket hub. It doesn't exist anymore. It won't let me do the transaction because it's too high. 
can I give you my American Express card right now over the phone? Wow. Oh my God. So there it is. And what I had offered was like a year program with me personally coaching. Her name was Rachel. I ended up becoming like her biggest champion for the, for the next year. I got to coach her. We released music together. She, you know, I helped her with so many things and I, I mean, it was so amazing. She paid me so much money. Um, And that was only because I thought, okay, why not? Why not? Seven to nine tiers. And, and one of those should be like a crazy, like I will fly to your house and play at your living room. <laughs> I don't know. Like, you know, figure something out that is so unusual. Um, and, and I think another thing in these tiers that is important is not to do what everyone else does. Like you can get handwritten lyrics and here's a t-shirt and here's a hat. I mean, yes, all those things are nice, but think about, do you have a special talent that is not music oriented? Do you do something that, like for example, right now we work with an artist from the Congo who lives in Stockholm, Sweden, and he is doing his pre-sale campaign and he's doing tears and he understands a, a healing teaching modality that, that he does not much to do with his music, although his music is very healing, but he is offering a workshop. He'll come and do a workshop for anyone that wants to learn his teaching healing modality and it's expensive. So I think this is a great way. If you, if you have fans, there was another example of a musician. She happened to be a fantastic baker. She loved baking cakes and cookies. And she added a tear into her crowdfunding campaign where if she would make a holiday, like if you had a, needed a wedding cake or like a big birthday cake or a cake for like, you know, a giant party, she sold five of those cakes and they were very expensive, you know, like $500. And that was a way of offering something. Her campaign was all about baking. One of the tiers was you could meet her in the park and she would have like the, the cake of the day and serve cake and do an acoustic show for everyone. So, I mean, there was there things like that. So think about like, what can you do that's interesting and special? My hip hop artist, Pete Miser, he, uh, one of the tiers was you got to get his old, his first pair of Adidas that he had ever, his, his three stripe Adidas banged up, used up, tired, old, broken ass sneakers that he toured the world with. He was in Dido's band. He's like, I stood on stage with Dido in my broken ass shoes and someone bought them. So, wow. you know, you just never, you can always do something fun and interesting that is like a little bit of your personality um, in your crowdfunding campaign. And it does not have to be like tier number one, hat, sticker, t-shirt, lyrics. You know, you can get interesting and right. offer all those other things. I love that because that's, again, going back to, you know, not being transactional, going, how do we create this cool human experience? Like, what would you want to do that's fun? And as you were talking about, like, the girl doing the cake in the park, I was thinking, if I was a fan of hers, that would be really cool, because I could invite my friends, we could all go to the park that day, maybe we go to the park anyways, or maybe we we hang out on Sundays anyway, but today, we're just going to go hang out with this young lady while she makes this cake. That's a really cool experience. And I think just that alone, on top of the fact that you're helping her, would make you as a fan want to participate. So I love that you shared that because I never really thought of that as being like, you know, uh, some of the tiers to offer. And I know that, um, and I know you probably hear this reference all the time. I just don't know a lot of people that are, you know, have had a huge success in crowdfunding, but I had read Amanda Palmer's book a few times and I always talk about her, but in her tiers and even in her Patreon account she offers really cool stuff like um one like what you were talking about like i will fly to your house and do a you know a show there and that sort of thing um for you and 10 people um but she also does stuff where she would take like uh disc jockey dj you know uh what are they gosh i can't i can't even think of the word right now turntables Turntable. she would paint them so she'd be i'm going to send you you know if you donate this much money you're going to get painted turntables so it's not even her music it's not the typical t-shirt like what you said or the the sticker or the mug or whatnot but it's hey a, a, a literally a pair of turntables you know that i'm going to paint or a postcard from a certain country where i'm going to be touring in or something you know she even has a tier that says i'm going to send you a surprise um 
But for her, she has that crowd and she's built that uh, relationship with her fans. And so they trust her that they're going to, you know, send something cool. But that's not what she is. She's not like a, you know, world renowned painter. She's an artist, but yeah. she used the painting as, as a, um, an option for them. So I think that that's. Um, and how cool. cool is that? Like if you're a giant Amanda Palmer fan and someone comes over to your house, you can be like, look at my custom made custom painted turntables. They're one of a kind. They're from Amanda Palmer. Like yes. that's pretty cool and really special. Well, and like those Adidas shoes that you were talking about, I think sometimes as, as artists, we underestimate what someone wants or would appreciate from us. Yes. Yes, that's right. I work with a, with an artist, um, Sean Johnson. He's got like a big band kind of swingy jazzy. He sells socks socks he wears great socks like he's a guy who has re- super style but he always has like a pair of like funky fun colorful socks and socks on his merch table and it's they don't say his name on it he just figured out like a really great place to buy really cool socks and he repackaged them with hit like a wrapper with his name and the fans go crazy they go up to the merch table and there's like different colors, different types. They buy seven or eight different types of funky fun socks. And That's so cool. it's so cool. <laughs> I mean, you think about that. It's like, you know, why can't your crowdfunding campaign have something that, you know, I, I work with um, a fabulous artist. Her name is Mary Jennings. She makes bolo ties. She's always done made things with her hands. And bolo ties are part of her brand. And she's got bolo ties on her merch table and she makes bolo ties for, for, for people. And it's, 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 it's what she does. And it's, it, she does it when she ever has a record release, she has a special bolo that she makes for just that release. And it totally works for her vibe and who she is. And she's a Nashville girl and people wear bolos and it's perfect. I feel like that gives me so many ideas. This makes me want to do my own crowdfunding campaign for something. I have a a tortilla chip company. I don't know if I ever shared that with you, but you do. um, Yeah. We make tortilla chips and salsas. We're actually in like whole foods and sprouts and, you know, a few um, like all natural type things. I'm thinking that would make such a cool, like, Hey, if you donate this much, you get my tortilla chips and salsa has nothing to do with the music. But you think about a fan like they would love I mean, they send me pictures all the time, you know, of like, you know, their kids dancing to my music while they're eating chips, you know, and and I feel like that would be I I never thought of that. So that's giving me some um, it's a perfect tie in. It's a perfect tie in. So I have just a couple uh, more questions for you, Ariel. This is awesome. I feel like I'm like I'm already gaining so much from this. um, So thank you. A big question is. I know I, people are always asking me to, and I'm like, oh, I think you should do this, you know, but I don't always know. But I think what's great is you actually have seen so many different campaigns. You've seen what works. You've seen what hasn't worked. You have all this data, data-driven ideas, which I love. Um, have you seen like, you know how you usually have a video on your page? Um, I've seen some people, I think either not post a video or just post something like just a music video or something like that. What do you recommend that an artist uses for their video? I mean, should they post a music video or should they be talking? Should they cover certain elements? Should it be a certain length? You know, what have you found is yep. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So back to the science of crowdfunding campaigns, there is actually a huge amount of evidence that campaigns that have a video that was created just for the campaign um, get funded more than campaigns that do not have a video. So you absolutely want to have a video. It has to be under three minutes long. It has to explain what the campaign is about and it should be fun or funny or quirky. You know, it should have, it should be a reflection of you, but yes, campaign videos are very important. And weirdly, this is bizarre. A lot of people won't even watch the video, but they will still fund seeing that there is a video on the page. So bizarre. Um, But yes, it is crucial to make a crowdfunding video um, as part of your campaign. And no, it should not just be like, oh, here's a great music video of me from two years ago that I put up on here. It should be specifically created for your campaign. 
So you should be, should you be speaking like to your audience? Like, Hey guys, this is what I'm doing. Like, or how do you, how do you usually recommend? Yes, you can do that. You could, I mean, I always tend to think that the videos that are humorous, if that works for your brand, um, are really great because they're, they're just funny and it's fun to watch a funny video. Um, Or videos that are really honest. I mean, in my crowdfunding campaign video, I was so nervous and scared and freaked out. Plus, I also hate being on video. So I was actually crying, crying on my video, crying. And I had to do like so many takes because I was so nervous and scared. I finally drank a lot of wine and I was crying. So I was drunk and crying and scared. And I was like, people felt bad. They're like, here's my credit. Right? Card. <laughs> Here, take the money girl. Oh my God. No, but I mean, it just, it was so confronting, but I was also really honest in the video being drunk and crying had a lot to do with the honesty that came forth. No, I'm kidding. It was really confronting. Um, so I think Oh, Again, you're talking about like when we see things that feel disingenuous, which I know you talk about probably in every module of your entire program, disingenuous doesn't work. Being honest works. If funny is your brand, go for it. If talking about mental health is your thing, do that. It, you know, do what feels totally right for you. If being wildly sarcastic is your thing, If walking around your neighborhood is your thing and doing it like in real time, you know, however it is you want to do it, but make a video for sure. And again, not to keep shilling the book, but you know, it's, it's really got everything like how long that video should be, where you should post that video. I mean, all of that is also very important as far as campaign strategy goes. Awesome. And actually, I did want to get into that because I know everyone's going to want to to know more about your book and the package that we're going to be offering. Um, You've talked so much about, you know, a lot of the main things right now. And I think even for me, like I've said, I've gained so much um, from this already since I've done a little bit of crowdfunding, but nothing. I haven't done a $60,000 campaign. So congratulations. That's awesome. Thanks. Oh, my God. Uh, Yeah. Tell everyone a little bit because I'm going to be providing a link. for people to actually purchase your book. And we put together a nice little bundle of a few different things. Can you let everyone know what they, um, what we're offering and what people can have access to? And I'll have the link somewhere on wherever this is. I don't know if it's in the description or you guys are looking at this on a page or I'll probably post this on Instagram as well. But um, can you let them know a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. So what we are offering is my book, Crowd Start. And because it is a several hundred page book that is a roadmap that breaks everything down. Um, That might not feel great for everyone because we all have so much free time these days to read a multiple hundred page book. So I made a course. It is a three part video course and each video is about 45 minutes long where I walk you through the roadmap, like exactly what you need to pre-prepare, launch, and successfully carry through your crowdfunding campaign. So I basically brought CrowdStart the book to life in a course. It comes with 26 cheat sheets. I formatted all your um, call outs on socials. I formatted all of the emails that you should be sending. You basically just have to copy, paste, add your own flavor and program the emails to go out. And I give you a 30 day template that you can follow so that we can ensure that your campaign um, gets off to a roaring success and completes with all the money that you want. And I'm also very clear in the course about you might want $50,000, but unless your mailing list has, my mailing list has 20,000 people on it, or it did when I launched my $60,000 campaign. and. 7,000 of those dollars came from one person. So you begin to do the math and um, you do have to have a large email list in order to get a large number. However, what would you do? How would you feel? Would you feel better if you had $5,000 in your pocket in 30 days? So you can set your goal so that it's absolutely achievable. I think that's another thing that we see time and time again is artists just didn't really compute 
how much they want versus how much can they really get based on how many fans they have. And that's very important. Um, And, you know, it's great. You can always work up to a larger number or wait until your mailing list and your fan list gets bigger. Um, But we, I talk a, a lot about that in the course too. It's like how to prepare, how to launch and how to succeed. And all those expectations, the realistic expectations. I saw a young lady, I think she had, she said she had a, a fairly small um, email list. I was watching an interview. It was just a few thousand people and she was able to raise $6,500. And I was there like, hey, that's a pretty fair number. I mean, $6,500 would absolutely help an artist. That would cover a lot of expenses for an artist. So that's great that you uh, cover all of that as well. So people know even what to shoot for. Um, so, and they know what a su- uh, successful campaign for them would look like. So awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. I would like to open this up to you guys, to everyone in here. If you guys have any questions um, for her, she's here with us right now. Um, she's offering her book. Um, wasn't it like number one on Amazon or something? Didn't I see that it was like a huge? It was. It was. Yeah. It had a great launch and we were number one in the financial and investing categories as well as in the music business category. And yeah, the book, the little book that could, the Crowdstar book, <laughs> no sells. And it always makes me so happy when people write me and say, I followed it and it worked and I made money and I'm like, yes, good. Oh, that's the best feeling ever. Awesome. Well, congratulations on that. And I want to just look at the chat box, open it up to everybody mm-hmm. here. Do you guys have any questions for her while she is here? Um, Like I mentioned, um, depending on where you're looking at this, we're going to have a link here for you to be able to um, get her book number one on Amazon. And she's just, you know, held her own $60,000 campaign and also been behind the success of many other campaigns. Um, Someone here, Sabrina, says, when is it a good time to make a crowdfunding? How many fans should you have on your email list or social media? First of all, we need to know your goal. If your goal is small and your fans are rich, that is another thing I talk about very candidly. I know a lot of people that have had successful crowdfunding campaigns because they know a lot of successful people. And like Christine said, like she didn't know that there'd be someone in her fan base that could just reach into their pocket and give $500 on MySpace. Like it didn't occur to her. If you know, begin to know your fans a little bit, Or if you think about, do I have a rich uncle who would love to support my art, but I've never asked? Or do I have a boss who's, or a mentor or people in my life that for them going out to dinner and dropping a lot of money on a fine meal is no big deal. Because if you have a lot of those people in your life, it's not a big deal for them to give you money. So it's an interesting way of pre-framing a campaign So it's impossible to answer that question about like when or how many, because if you know 20 people who have a lot of money, they could help you get to your goal very, very quickly. So a lot of a good crowdfunding campaign is not about how many thousands of people or hundreds of people are on my list, but it's about who do I know and who can I specifically make sure I ask? Because that was another thing I had family members who they don't use the internet. They're in their eighties and I know they had money. And I very specifically asked them on the phone. Like they never saw my crowdfunding campaign because they didn't know what crowdfunding was, but I invited them to participate and they did. So a lot of it has to do with your personal fan base. So, so I hate to say, I don't have a like a stock answer for how many people should be on your list and when should you start? I think you have to have some people on your list, at least a couple of hundred. Um, And then really in the book, in the beginning of the book, I explore to even make a spreadsheet and go, okay, Christine, she's known me for a couple months. She probably would buy one of my books, 15 bucks. I'm gonna put her down for that. I'm gonna guesstimate that that's what she'd be good for. Mm -hmm. Okay. My uncle who had a lot of money and I'm his niece, I could put him down for 500 and he came through for 500. So you can begin to guesstimate how you could think about your fans and your friends and your family and see if you can put together at least a bit of a roadmap to help you along. I hope that's helpful. 
I think that's fantastic. Um, I was also going to say like earlier what you were talking about when you held your, you were saying it was like a crazy 30 days of your campaign is realizing that is what it is though. It's a campaign. It's not just a posting a link and hoping that people join. I mean, you're talking about, hey, I, I need to make a list of people that I know that might want to support me. I'm going to personally call them because some people don't have internet. They won't even see that. They're not on Facebook. I mean, you're doing a sales campaign and you have yep. to be comfortable with doing that, with asking yep. people for that help. That's but that's why you make that list, like you said, of the people that you think would want to help. I have another I question see, from Carrie. I do Coulter. see it. Yeah, I see a question. Um, someone asked, what is the right amount of time for a successful campaign? 30 days is the magic number. That's good to know. Okay, so 30 days, no, nothing shorter. That's kind of been like the, that's the most successful that you see. For a big sprint goal, 30 days is the right amount. A lot of people are like, well, I'll do 40 days. I'll do 50 days. I'll give people more time. Don't give people more time. The more time <laughs> you give people, the more time they'll take. Right. And I think like you said, how, I mean, there's always, I mean, there's so many different things if you guys have, have never heard this concept, but creating urgency, like urgency, like we only got 30 days to do this guys. Like this is our, you know, we're doing this as a crowd. You know, I think um, I'm trying to imagine like for 45 days hearing from someone about their campaign, like that might be a little long because you're just seeing the same thing being posted over and over and over again. So I think um, that sounds great. Um, the 30 days. Uh, I'm looking in here. I'm not seeing any other questions for now. I don't know if you see any, um, Ariel. No, I think we, we if anyone has any that. other questions, we'll give you guys a few more minutes. I think this has been really informative. I think the biggest, um, you know, takeaway is one, you have to have that crowd to even begin um, some sort of relationship. Cause I look back at mine and I'm like, okay, you know, I was able to raise the money for my single. That was my very first campaign, but I had a crowd. There were people that were, um, you know, there wanting, um, you know, wanting to support. I think we covered a lot today and I don't want to, I think, I think it's really important for artists to make money making art, which is the whole point of whether you're crowdfunding or whether you're asking asking your fans like Becca's doing to support you by bundling something special. Um, but every artist deserves to be paid. So that is, that's what I'd like to leave you with. For those of you that have that little voice going, I shouldn't do that, or I don't wanna ask for that. Um, half of the game is telling that little voice to shut up and tell yourself that you did, you do deserve it because you're making art and you deserve to be paid for it. All right, everybody, if you would like to get Ariel's number one best-selling book along with a few extra bonuses just for watching this interview today, she's going to walk you through exactly what to do each day for those 30 days so that you can have a successful crowdfunding campaign. So just make sure to check the description, wherever that is on this page, click on the link. Let's crowdfund your next project, guys. Good luck, everybody. I'm Christine Morell, and I'll see you on the next one.